for the basic concept of calculus is the limit. That means you, you will probably see that we always talk about some limiting situation, some limiting um, condition. We're doing something, but we do have limits. And let's see some comparisons between pre-calculus and calculus. That means, as mentioned, calculus is dynamic, is the mathematics of change, and pre-calculus is more static. Calculus can also be learned, as, as said before, a limit machine. That means what we have, we do have a pre-calculus, like algebra, algebra is the set of tools, and then we're going through this limit process, always. And then we're creating a set of tools that we will call calculus. Calculus is actually creating a problem. In order to solve it, we always need algebra. And some things that we can calculate without calculus, or we definitely need a calculus. That means, for example, the value of the function at the point C, we can just simply use the algebra. How function behaves near to point C, we will need a limit concept and we will need a calculus. Slope of the line or slope of the secant line, slope of the curve, slope of the tangent. That's similar ideas, but we can see for one of them we need just algebra, for the other part we need calculus. Average rate of change. It's easy. Two points we can definitely compute uh, without calculus. But what's happened if we would like to check the rate of change at that instant, at this moment, at one point at the time, which we will call instantaneous rate of change? That's a big thing for calculus. And another comparison, um, height of the curve. Let's pick a few of them. And that's, that's, that's easy, almost like a value. And the maximum height. Yeah? We have to find this maximum point on the given interval. That's definitely, uh, definitely calculus. Direction of motion along the line and directions of motion along the curve. And the, just the area of the shape with the straight lines like rectangle, easy. But what about the area under the curve? Okay, we can see one side is curve. We will need a calculus. Length of the line segment, length of an arc, and I think one more. Um, the surface area of the cylinder and the surface area of the solid of revolution. Or the volume, the same thing. Okay? Volume of the rectangle, I mean rectangular solid, or volume of the region under the surface surface. And the last thing, I mean the last thing that I have, because we can, we can have much, much more examples, comparisons, some of the finite number of terms. If we have quite big numbers, but finite numbers, we can deal without calculus. But what about some of the infinitely many numbers, many terms? Of course, at first you will think, is this even possible? to get the sum of infinitely many terms. Yes, we do have some, again, some limits probably yeah, will be involved. Okay, that's me, that's lots of ideas, lots of examples like how we can see calculus, but please remember it's definitely a, a brand, um, part of the mathematics that deals with continuous changes something is changing always and we have to catch it that change and we have to catch it at one moment okay that's mean the first section talk about talks about tangent line problem and the velocity problem that means let's see if we can check this if we understand this and this will be nice introduction That's what we will start. We will start, first of all, with the definition of the tangent. The definition of the tangent, first of all, was defined really simply, nicely, and apparently correctly by one of the mathematicians, and I will say the German pronunciation, Euclid. Okay, that's, the German, that's the German pronunciation. 
And what he said, he said that the tangent line is the line that intersects a circle once and only once. And this is correct. Because when I draw a line that intersects a circle once, it's definitely a tangent. But of course, the key is to put the circle. But what actually happened when we have more complex curve? This will be not really adequate definition. Because looking at the curve, okay, we can definitely see that the blue line is intersecting only once the curve C. However, it's not a tangent. Because we all have some feelings what tangent really means. Okay? And looking at the line T, the pink one, looks like it's not really a tangent because we're not satisfying a definition. This curve, I mean this line, intersects the curve twice. However, when we use the limit, just really, really intuitively, uh, I would like to limit my view at the moment just to the neighborhood of the point P, close to the point P. Then I don't really, I'm not really investigating what is happening with the curve and the line further away. But at the point P, it looks like the curve is intersecting once. But the word intersect, we will change and we will adopt the word which actually it's taken directly, the direct translation from Latin, tangent means touching. Okay? That's when we can see that the curve, it's actually, I mean the line, it's touching the curve only once. The blue line is not really touching, it's intersecting, but that's not a definition of the tangent. That's mean the that definition of the tangent is, we will call a line, tangent line to the curve, if the line is touching a curve only once at the certain point. Also, touching results that the curve and the line, tangent line, has the same direction. Yes, we can see if we will go even closer, again, the limiting even closer, the pink line and the curve, we almost, we can't distinguish the difference. They have the same direction, the same steepness, the same slope. Okay? That means that's the definition of the tangent. Okay, and I think I have, that means we can see tangent line means touching. Yes? The line can touch the curve, that's the tangent. Of course, only at one point. And that line and the curve, they have to have the same direction at the point of contact. That means now we do understand the tangent. Let's do the first exercise. Let's find an equation of the tangent line to the parabola x squared at the point one one. That's when we do have the parabola, we, everybody knows x squared, and we have point one one, and I draw a tangent. Okay, that's mean tangent line, it's theoretically a line. If I will use point slope form, we remember from algebra, point slope, because I do have point. Okay? I can definitely substitute y minus one, that slope, x minus one, because that's my points. But what's happened? I need a slope, right? And it's not easy. We know how to compute the slope. Slope is simply the changes along the y and the changes along the x and the, the ratio of this. But having two points is not a problem. Having only one point, how can I compute a slope between point and itself? Okay. That's we can see, it's not the easy thing. But what we will do, since we really need two points, because we are, I will pick another point on the curve. That means I did pick the point with the coordinates x and x squared, because that's the function. Or maybe, let me change, I will pick two and four. This is my point one one, point of the tangency, and I did pick the point two, and two squared is four. 
Having a line, the blue line, going through two points, we know that that's the secant. Having 1, 1 and 2, 4, it's, it's extremely easy to find the slope of the line M, uh, the line uh, PQ. Rise over run, changes along the Y, changes along the X. We're changing from, that's actually 4. From 4 to 1, it's 3. From 2 to 1, it's 1. 3 over 1, 3. Okay, that we do have a slope of the blue line. But we may probably notice it's not, um, I mean, it's not a tangent line. It is close, but not, not enough. That means now I will, if I will ask you a question, what we have to do, I'm sure you will answer that we have to pick a point. I mean, what we have to do in order to get better approximation, better calculation with respect to the slope of the tangent. You will probably tell me that we have to pick a point which is much, much closer to one. Because I did pick two, but now again, we have to remember from one to two, it's a huge distance. We have infinitely many points and two is actually far away from one. That's not good, that's not calculus. That means what I have to do, I have to pick a point which is really, really close to one. And then I can draw a secant, still secant line, but that secant line will represent almost, almost a tangent. That means let's try. Okay, we can see. I will move the point Q closer and closer and closer to the point P. Of course, I can't pick the point P, but I will, I will be as close as possible. Okay, that means from the first one, I did pick, this is my point one, and this is 1.5. And calculating the corresponding value, squaring 1.5, I have 225. And the slope, difference in y's, difference in x. I will switch off the camera because it's covering part of the screen. OK, and we do have a slope of the blue line, 2.5. Let's do the same thing. Let's do the same thing for one, and I believe I pick 1.1. 1.1 will give me 1.21, difference in y, difference in x. The slope of the blue line is 2.1. And then I'm going even closer. Of course, I can't really, this is one, 1.01. The corresponding value is this one, and the slope is 2.01. That means having a slope 2.5, 2.1, 2.01, you can probably notice and think that if we will go even closer, the slope will be almost 2. Okay? That we can't really go point Q, we can't be. We can, this is the limiting position. My limit is 1. I'm approaching point P really close, but I can't reach that point. I can be extremely close. I can be at 1.00001, and it's still not one, but we almost at one. Okay? That we can see the slope of the tangent is two. The same calculation I did from the left-hand side. 0 0.5, 0 0.9, 0 0.999, like going close from the left-hand side. 0 0.5, approaching one. 0 0.9, even closer and 0.999 even closer. And the slopes of the blue line, of the secant line, behaves like that. 1.5, 1.9, 1.999. That means if I will reach almost one, the slope is two. As we can see, that's the way to get a slope of the tangent. We kind of Cheating, I can say, because we did create a secant based on the definition of the slope. I have to have two points, but the points are almost indistinguishable. They are almost the same, almost. And that's the way to actually get a slope of the tangent line. That means let's take everything, wrap up with the nice terminology. Slope of the tangent line is the limiting position of the slope of the secant line. And we do have a symbols, we do have a notation. Limit, that means we can see the basic concept of calculus, limits. 
we will only look, we will only write L I M, lib. Underneath, we have to show, we have to indicate what is happening, what value is approaching, and at, like which value is approaching which value. Q was approaching P. That means P, we can see it's not equal to, it's getting closer and closer. And we were looking for the limiting position of the slope of the secant. Slope of the secant line. And we got slope of the tangent. That means I can use my formula of the function to define the slope y2 minus y1 x2 minus x1. And that's just f of b minus f of a, a minus b, but I use the values. And we know, we know that it's almost 2. But what's also, what is important, we will not write the approximation. We will actually write an equal sign because we know what is behind the limit definition. The limit is telling me what I did. X is not really one, but we did the whole process and we've got two. That means the limit is equal to two. Please notice, but please notice that this is not equal to. X is approaching one. The X, the coordinate of Q, was getting really, really close to the coordinate of the point P, one. Okay, that means equation of the tangent is just 2x, y is equal to 2x minus 1, if we finish with the point slope form. But that's important. Slope of the tangent line is the limit of the slope of the secant line. Now, let's look at similar concept, the velocity problem. Okay. That we definitely know how to find the average rate of change, average velocity. But now the question is, how can we define the velocity at one instant, at one point? That's the same picture that we just, I was just showing you at the beginning of the session. Average, no problem. I can compute the average velocity, average speed. But what about the speed at one moment? That's when we're driving, I can simply like say, I did draw 150 miles, and let's say in three hours. That means we know that is 50 miles per hour. Then we can simply divide distance over the time. But during my time, during my trip, three hours I was driving, and let's say you will be looking at me exactly at one hour. Okay, exactly at T at one hour, like I will be passing some point and maybe you will be watching me and maybe possibly you will take a picture of me. That's been on the picture, of course, I'm not moving, but I'm definitely moving at that time. And what is exactly my speed at this moment? Yes, we can see that I mean it's not easy. Like how can I, in order to get a speed, in order to get a rate of change of the distance over the time, we need a time interval and of course the distance, distance, the changes in distance. A speed at one moment, I'm not moving. But what we will do, we will use the same idea. I'm not moving, but I will, in order to get my speed, I will take a teeny tiny time interval. Let's, let's say from one hour to 1.00001 seconds. Okay, that means on this tiny movement, I actually have my distance. My car definitely moves on that. That means I have a distance over that tiny, really, really tiny time interval, and then I can get my speed. That's actually how the speedometer is uh, calculating the speed. Okay, that means it's quite clever guy sitting behind the dashboard, behind the speedometer, is really using a calculus. We don't even think, right? We're just looking at the the, the meter. Let me let's see. Let's take a function that will represent um, oh, this function as equals to 10 t squared. Just represents the position function. S is the distance. T is time. That means, uh, and let's say t is in hours. After one hour, you can see it's just 10 miles. Okay. 
Oh, hang on, what I did. Oh, I think I need this first of all. Okay, that's me one more time. The same, the same, I mean the same position function. S, the position is defined as a 10 times t squared. That's my, my formula for my trip. After one hour, exactly what at one hour, I drove 10 miles. At four, 160. That means it's really easy to find the average velocity between one hour and the fourth hour of my trip. Because it's three hour, in three hours, I drove 160 minus 10. Actually, it's the same that I just, the same numbers that I gave you. That means it's 50 miles per hour. But we can see this is 50, the changes, and this is 50. That we can definitely see that the calculation that I did, distance over the time, is exactly the same like computing a slope of the secant. Okay. Changes along the y, changes along the x. Of course, y is the distance, x is time in this time. It's an application. That means that's the conclusion. The slope of the secant line represents the average velocity or simply the average rate of change, any rate of change, not only distance over the time. That means if you have to find the average rate of change or average velocity, always think about the slope of the secant line. Slope of the line that intersects the curve twice, delta y changes along the y, changes along the x. However, that's the main thing. How can I find my instantaneous velocity exactly at one hour of my trip? I know that I, I made 10 miles but what about my speed i need a distance i mean a time interval and a distance interval that means just what i said we will create like a time interval 1.00001 right and then i have to find my distance here which will be um the changes along the distance one, two, three, four, five, let's be consistent, is this, and 10.00001 squared times 10, because that's my, and as we can see, this will give me, of course, the approximation, but we will get an idea, because I will create another point and make a secant, but the secant will be almost like a tangent. I mean, almost like a tangent line, which we can see my conclusion is that the slope of the tangent line exercise is giving me exactly the same solution, the same result, like an instantaneous rate of change, instantaneous velocity. That's mean one more time, in order to get, in order to get an instantaneous velocity, we have to look at this problem as a slope of the tangent. At the moment, we don't have a proper tools to get the slope of the tangent, but we will definitely develop them. This means I can, well, and of course we know that the slope of the tangent is the limiting position of the slope of the secant. And as you can see, this is secant, but we do, we're limiting, we're really limiting, we're getting closer to one. Okay, that means that's, the really, really basic idea of the limits. And let's just finalize this session with a few problems. That means first question is, draw a graph of a function f of x where the instantaneous velocity at two is very different from the average velocity between two and five. First of all, please notice that asking for the instantaneous velocity, we only need one point because it's at that instant. Average, we only have to provide. We always have to provide two. That means this is time, and this should be t. And this is my function f of t. And I don't know, I will maybe draw a function like that. And now, Mm, let's see. I will draw possibly a, because instantaneous velocity 
means a slope of the tangent. Slope of tangent at two. That means I will draw tangent. And we, I pick nice point. Probably you can say this slope is zero. Horizontal lines has the slope zero. And now the question is asking for different average velocity between two and five. And this means slope of the secant. Slope of secant. And I can maybe pick here and then I will draw a line. Oh, actually, let's pick a five here, just not to mess. That's what we can see. This slope is, I don't know, negative half or maybe even less. We don't, it's definitely negative because it's going down. But the idea, the point of this question is to know that instantaneous velocity is simply slope of the tangent. Average velocity, slope of the secant represents this. Okay, now the question is asking for the question is asking for the function f of t that have instantaneous velocity at two exactly the same like average velocity. I, mean, I can even use the same similar graph. Okay, I will use the similar graph, but I will place my points differently. I, mean, I can say two, maybe the same, and I want the instantaneous velocity, which is slope of the tangent, must be exactly the same, which I can even make the same line. As we can nicely see, this is tangent line at two. Tangent at two, and it's exactly the same like a secant line. Secant line on the interval from two to five. So you can see the same slope, That's which means the rate of change is the same. Instantaneous rate of change, average rate of change. Okay, and I do have final question, which is exam type question. Do not miss this question. Use the sketch of the graph y is equal f of x below to find the sum of sum, yes, paying attention to details, instantaneous rate of change at seven and average rate of change on the interval from zero to two. So when we just learned that instantaneous rate of change at seven, it's gonna be the slope of the tangent. Slope of tangent at seven. This is seven. Oh, looks like horizontal. This slope is zero. That means I do have zero plus because they asking for the sum instantaneous rate of change at seven is zero. And then average rate of change is simply a secant line between that's the corresponding value for zero, that's the corresponding value for two. When I connect them, I create a line. Slope of this line will give me slope average rate of change, slope of secant. And I believe this slope is a four units down and two units, it's negative two. Zero plus negative two, of course, is negative two. That's when please remember the most important thing for today is for this session is average rate of change, slope of the secant. Instantaneous rate of change, slope of the tangent line. Thank you.